Brothers and sisters in Islam, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a, a reminder. Uh, first and foremost, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He accept all your righteous deeds and your good actions. And it is a very pleasing sight to see how many of you got up after Salat al Isha and prayed your Sunan. Some pray the Sunnah, some pray the Witr. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept and increase you in concern. However, there is a sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you should know about. And I don't want to hold it back from you. And this is the time to explain it to you. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, and he said <clears throat> that the best prayer a person could pray is the prayer that he prays at home, except the obligatory prayer. The best obligatory prayer is the one that is prayed in the masjid. And so what we learn from this hadith is that if you pray Salat the sunnah at home and some of you wait and do not pray it in the masjid, rather they wait until they go home and pray, then the one who prayed a sunnah at home has earned much more reward than the one who prayed that very same sunnah here in the masjid. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, do not turn your homes into graveyards. And turning a home into a graveyard, it means abandoning the prayers at home. So the best salat you will ever pray and the most rewarding salat is the salat you pray at home. Except the fajr, wal dhahr, wal asr, wal maghrib, wal isha. The most rewarding of that will be to pray in the masjid in congregation. But inshallah ta'ala that is clean. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us all. Tonight's lecture is titled Overcoming Sins and Desires. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, Al-Iman is two halves. Iman is two halves. The first half of Iman is patience. And the second half of Iman is gratitude. If a person practices patience in his life, he has fulfilled half his Iman. And if a person practices gratitude in his life, and all the obligations that we do are part of gratitude, then he has presented before Allah Azza wa Jal with complete Iman. And I begin by saying this, because when we observe patience and look into patience, then patience is of three types. Patience upon the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. So when we pray, that requires patience. When you get up and make wudu every single day in the cold weather, that requires patience. When you give charity and zakat, that requires patience. Even when you do al-hajj wal umrah, that requires a lot of patience. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He said, فَعْبُدْهُ وَاسْطَبِرْ لِعِبَادَتِهِ Worship Allah and be patient upon His worship. Right? So that's the first type of patience. Patience upon the worship of Allah. The second type of patience is patience away from the prohibitions. So when there is something that is haram, when there is a sin you know about, when there is an evil desire and a temptation, and you keep away from it, you require sabr, you require patience to keep away from it. When I know that a zina is haram, but a zina is very tempting, especially nowadays, in this world of corruption and fitan, zina is very easily accessed. A zina of the eyes. You open your phone and immediately you'll see al-haram. A zina of the tongue. When a person speaks inappropriate words to the opposite gender, have a zina of the tongue, a zina of the hands. When you touch that which Allah Azza wa Jal forbid upon you, a zina of the legs. When you walk to that which is haram, and ultimately, the zina of the privates, when it penetrates the other in the haram, all of these are forms of zina and they are haram. It requires a lot of patience to keep away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Therefore, we require patience when we worship Allah and we require the very same patience when we keep away from sins and haram. And the third type of patience is patience upon the calamities of life. So when a person goes through a health issue or a financial issue, or he loses a loved one, 
or whatever it is of the pains and the calamities and the hardships and the difficulties of life that requires patience. And how do you exercise patience? By saying that which is pleasing to Allah and avoiding saying words that are displeasing to Allah. So let's say you are struck by a calamity, financial calamity, or you lost a loved one. And then you said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. That's practicing patience in a time of calamity. You'll be accepted from those who practice patience in a time of calamity. But if you say words that are displeasing to Allah, such as, Ya Allah, why me? Why am I in this situation? What have I done wrong of Allah? And you start speaking words, I think Allah has oppressed me with the situation I'm in. Then you have lost patience during a time of a calamity and you have brought another calamity upon yourself. So this is what patience is. And so I explained all of this at the very beginning because I said to you that our lecture tonight is overcoming sins and desires. And I said that requires a lot of patience. So what I want to equip you with inshallah ta'ala are tools and skills that you're able to use in your life that will help you avoid and overcome sins and desires in your life. There's about 10 points. The more you have and the more you're able to practice of these points, the more protection you'll have against the sins and the desires. The stronger iman and the stronger resistance you'll have against these sins and desires. According to how many you're able to practice, and as you listen to me, you see how many of them do you have, which one is easy for you, which one is not, and start working on them. But let me say at the very beginning, that the ulama, rahimahumullah, they have mentioned that keeping away from prohibitions is better than engaging in voluntary deeds. You know, if you were tempted to do a sin and you avoided it for the sake of Allah, that is better than someone who is engaging in voluntary actions. Fasting, let's say, a Monday and Thursday, a Sunnah Monday and Thursday. Which one is more preferable? Keeping away from a sin is more preferable than engaging in voluntary deeds. And why is that the case? And by the way, this is the opinion of Aisha radiallahu anha, wal Hassan al Basri, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Ibn Rajab, and many of the ulama. Why is it better? Because keeping away from prohibitions is an obligation. It is wajib. Whereas doing voluntary deeds is recommended. And the wajib takes precedence over that which is recommended. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ If I prohibit you from something, then keep away from it. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِتَّقِ الْمَحَارِمْ تَكُنْ أَعْبَدَ النَّاسِ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, avoid the prohibitions and you will be the most righteous of mankind. You see that? Avoid the haram and you will be the most righteous among mankind. And why is that the case? Because a'malul bir, righteous deeds, such as feeding the poor, helping people, voluntary deeds that you do. Everyone does this. Everyone can do this. The righteous and the rebellious do this. But only a true believer avoids sins and avoids the prohibitions. Well, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he said, مَا عَبَدَ الْعَابِدُونَ بِشَيْءٍ أَفْضَلَ بِتَرْكِهِمْ مَا نَهَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ He said the best thing a worshipper can do concerning his servitude to Allah is to avoid what Allah prohibited. That's the best thing a worshipper could do. وَأَبْنْ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He said avoiding a sin, avoiding the sin of oppression is much better than 500 voluntary hajj. Why? Because voluntary hajj is recommended. But avoiding a sin is wajib. It's obligatory. So this is what our ulama, rahimahumullah, wanted to discuss and explain. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he counted from among those that are shaded under the shade of Allah on the day of judgment, 
He said, وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُمْ رَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ A man which a woman called, she called him to commit a sin. And he said to her, I fear Allah. See this person? He avoided a sin and he was rewarded by being under the shade of Allah on the day of judgment. And so therefore, avoiding sins is a huge thing in life. Don't think that the sin you avoid, Haki just went and, oh, I missed an opportunity of temptation and desire and enjoyment and pleasure. You restrain yourself. Maybe there is difficulty, there is pain in avoiding a sin. But that difficulty, that pain is called sabr in Islam. And you are rewarded immensely for it. And you will be grateful to Allah on the day of judgment to find out that the sin you avoided for Allah ended up putting you under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And admits you into the paradise and earn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. Now, so I share with you Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. He also said, He said, righteousness is not fasting the days and praying the nights. He said, righteousness is fulfilling that which Allah obligated and commanded and keeping away from that which Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited. And that is at taqwa. That is the definition of at taqwa. To do what Allah commanded and to keep away from that which He prohibited subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so we move on to these 10 points that inshallah ta'ala will give you that skill that you require bi idhnillah to avoid the sins. Number one, and this is from the works of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. He said, number one, to know that sins are repulsive, abhorrent, despicable, meaning they are disgusting and filthy in nature. Whenever you approach a sin, that's the first knowledge you're supposed to need in order to keep away from it. Look at the sin, observe the sin, and start speaking and discussing to yourself that this sin is disgusting, it is filthy in nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only forbids sins because they are filthy in nature. And when you're aware of this matter, this becomes a reason for why you're able to remain patient and overcome the sin and the desire. I tell you how. You know, a normal human being whose fitra, yani his natural disposition has not been distorted, a normal human being runs away from anything that is disgusting, right? And yani now, if you smelt something bad, there is immediately a face of disgust and you perhaps close your nose and you run away. That's a normal human being. If you are to taste something bad, naturally, you will move it away, you'll spit it out, and you won't come near it ever again, right? This is what a human does. If you are to see something disgusting, let's say you entered a public toilet, and you saw all urine around the toilet, disgusting sight, the smell is horrible, you will run away, and you'll hold yourself perhaps until you get back home. Look what the human does when he sees something that is disgusting and filthy in nature. And the human being comes close to that which is good, that which is pleasant. You smell a nice smell. You ask about it. Mm, brother, what is this smell? Where did you get from? What its name? Right? You eat something beautiful. You want to learn its recipe so that you can cook it. And you know, like now, we smell this biryani, mashallah. <laughs> this is the human being. That's the nature of the human being. And so... You need to know that sins are filthy and they are disgusting. This is a very important principle. And so the idea is, the question that you're supposed to ask yourself whenever you know something is haram, you say, why did Allah make alcohol haram? Why did he make pork haram? Why did he make a zina haram? Why did he make a riba haram? All of the sins have one answer to them. They are haram because they are harmful. They are filthy. They are disgusting. They will damage you. They will damage your soul. They will damage your heart. They'll damage you in the grave. They'll bring you fire on the day of judgment. They'll bring upon the curse of Allah, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no goodness in them. 
They will damage your Iman, your relationship with Allah. Every single sin was made haram because of the immense amount of damage and filth and impurity it will bring to your heart and to your soul. Look at alcohol, for example. How many times do we hear on the news, research comes out, finally proving that there is some benefit in alcohol. Then three, four years later, actually all those studies were wrong, and now the scientists have reached a conclusion that zero alcohol is good for you. And then two, three years later, uh, one cup is good for you. And then another five years later, actually nothing is good for you. And these people are confused. Why? Because they don't have any wahi to guide them. We have wahi. Allah told us it is haram. Haram, why? Because it's filthy and disgusting and harmful. Khalas, I don't need any research. I don't need any research paper as a Muslim, I'm convinced. And I'll just continue observing the West, how they keep going back and forth on their opinions. And we ask Allah Azza wa to guide them. Look at drugs. You know, the harmful state of drugs and what corruption and filth it brings upon a person. Look at pork and its filthy nature and what harms it brings to people. Look at riba, interest. Interest is oppression. Look at these current uh, interest rises that have been happening around the world. How many people have fallen into depression and a sick mental state because of that? Where's the goodness in that? Where's the goodness in riba? Where is the goodness in interest? It's filthy, it's harmful to the people. It is oppression of the people. So Allah made it haram. You look at smoking and its harmful effects. Ashisha, argila, vaping, all of these matters. They are harmful to the human being. Not just to your body and to your soul, but also to your spiritual state. It brings you Allah's anger. It brings sayyat upon you. Look at azina, HIV, AIDS, genital warts. Look at the harms as zina has in society. Kids are abandoned. Children that come as a result of a zina fornication are abandoned in society. And they are murdered as well. How? In the abortion. That even here in this country, Australia, abortion is legal up until the age of six months. Six months. That's already a child that has formed. And it is legal in this country to abort maximum the age of six months and you need approval of two doctors. See, a, see the harmful effect of a zina. It leads to abortion and killing a human being. Anything past the age of four months is considered murder. And then look at the sin of homosexuality. And what does it bring? of pain and struggle and harm to a person. Anal cancer, genital warts, AIDS, HIV, monkeypox, human papilloma virus, hepatitis A, B and C which have no cure. So sins in general are all filthy and disgusting and extremely harmful to the human health and to the human soul and to his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I look at the sin of pornography and addiction to pornography. These are studies that say a person becomes in a state of isolation, increased aggression, distorted beliefs, distorted perceptions about, uh, about relationships, negative feelings within themselves, and they neglect other areas in life. Look at the kind of filth and the harm it brings upon a person. Wallahi, it is much better to strive and struggle against yourself, to keep your eyes shut and closed from obscene images, then to enjoy a moment or two with them and then feel all of this later on in your life because you couldn't control yourself for a minute or two. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal declared all these matters haram, because they are harmful. And so the intelligent, sane person keeps away from that which is harmful. Even if he wasn't a believer, yani it was mentioned that some of the Arabs, they would never drink alcohol. And when they were asked about this, Anta, you're a kafir, why don't you drink alcohol? They would answer saying, how can a sound, sane-minded person 
intoxicate himself and then act like an idiot in the street and in front of his family and in his home. I can't do this. These are kuffar. Back in the time, they would avoid alcohol because of its harm. Now people are a different story. But sometimes, I tell you this, sometimes matters could be confusing. You might see them as good. However, the reality, they are bad. You might come to the realization, okay, this is a sin and this is prohibited and this is prohibited. But I fail to see how is this harmful. I fail to see the haram in it. I fail to see the harm in it. Right? This sometimes could happen. Now, I've been telling you about the sins being disgusting and filthy. And then you might say, no, no. But this is a sin and it seems to be good. No one's ever spoken bad about it. Where does this come from? From a shaitan. And the first trick of a shaitan is to decorate the sin and make it look beautiful. So don't be confused. And the shaitan did this. The first person he did this to was Adam alayhi salam. Allah Azza wa Jal forbid Adam from eating from the tree in the paradise. Therefore that must be filthy and disgusting. That is haram. Do not come near it. What did the shaitan do? A shaitan came to Adam and he said to him, هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ وَمُلْكٍ لَا يَبْلَى He said, Adam, should I direct you and point you to a tree that is known as the eternal tree? If you eat from it, you're going to remain in here forever in the paradise. Or perhaps you and your wife would become two angels. See how he decorated the sin? Allah said, keep away from it. Well, shaitan went and decorated and dressed this sin by telling him, look how beautiful this, eat from it, you're going to become an angel in the paradise. Yalla, go ahead. And that's what the shaitan does. With every single sin that's on earth, it's always decorated. Huh? And sometimes, literally, look at homosexuality, for example. Yeah, well, with the rainbow colors, I love this love and positive words and positive connotation to it. This is the deal, this is the works of the shaitan. He has to decorate the sin, otherwise no one will come to it. Look at alcohol. Alcohol. Look at the description that alcohol is given. Then I just tell you this is a bottle of wine. This is some Shiraz coming from the wild forest, uh, uh, tasting of, 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 with, with a hint of vanilla and some berries. And long description. And you look at it, you say, subhanAllah, what kind of taste is this? Uh, especially on the airplane. You open the menu, you'll find the wine section. There's like four or five lines describing one line. One, 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 one wine. And then at the end, there's orange juice, apple juice, that's it. <laughs> because then, uh, well, the halal, no problems. See the ID? You need to be careful. So you might look at a sin and say, but where's the harm in this? Be careful. A shaitan has already done his job long time ago to decorate it and design it. So how are we going to know what's haram? Learn your religion. Learn Al-Islam. Learn the Quran. Whatever Allah has said is haram. I do not care how many people dress it with goodness and beautify it. It is haram. That's it. Very simple. Right? So that's the first thing. You must, I mean, you must learn. You have to learn. How are you going to avoid something if you don't know what to avoid? Therefore, it becomes very important to learn your religion on this basis. And that's the first point. Khalas, that's very easy. Every single time a person is tempted with a sin and an evil desire, think twice. Think about its horrible nature and its filthy, disgusting nature. And question yourself. If you saw something filthy, wouldn't you run away from it? Sins are exactly the same manner. So have some self-respect and run away from it. Okay. Number two, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, for a person to overcome sins and desires and restrain himself from sins is to have shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have shyness of Allah. When the servant knows that Allah azza wa jal is looking at him, watching over him, when you know that Allah sees you and he hears you, then you will be too shy in front of Allah to expose yourself to his anger and his punishment. That's number two. Having shyness of Allah. What does shyness mean? In Arabic it's called al-haya. 
Al Haya, it comes from the word Hayat, which means life. When a person is shy of Allah, meaning he has life in his heart. Today, no one will dare to commit a sin in front of his father or his mother or his wife or her husband. No one will dare to commit a sin in front of his own children, even if they were young. Why? Because he's shy. He's shy. How can I commit a sin in front of my wife? In front of my brother. How? No, 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 no. I can't do it. I'm, I can't even think of it. I'm very embarrassed and shy. What would they think of me? How are they going to deal with me later on? Who deserves this shyness of you? These people or Allah? Allah deserves it much more. Therefore, in the same manner, you're able to avoid a sin because you are shy of people around you watching you then you have that instinct within you to understand and know that Allah Azza wa Jal above all watches you. And Allah Azza wa Jal's opinion about you is much more important than anyone's opinion about you because it is Allah who will judge you on the day of judgment and not people. So be shy of Allah Azza wa Jal and that would help you keep away from sins. If a person was in a room alone, and you heard the door squeaking and you were engaged in something haram, you will immediately find the power and the strength to stop. And then when you realize it was only the wind that moved the door, you'd be relieved. Alhamdulillah. And the question is, but wasn't Allah seeing you all the time? And then you got terrified from wind that moved the door and that wind was a blessing of Allah coming into that room so that you can breathe fresh oxygen and you use that blessing of Allah to continue to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal if then a person is supposed to be shy of Allah Azza wa Jal and know that Allah watches him at all times uh, there is a matter here that you can practice whenever you your nafs approaches to commit a sin there is always a noise in your mind that is telling you Allah is watching, right? Of course, because a believer knows Allah is watching. If you don't believe Allah is watching you, a person becomes a kafir. So there is no doubt, even the most rebellious Muslim, when he approaches to commit a sin, there is something in his heart and in his mind that's bothering him, that's telling him, there's a noise that's saying Allah is watching. I want you to do something. When you approach or when a person approaches committing a sin, we ask Allah Azza wa to save us from all sins, major and minor. See that noise that's within you that's saying Allah is watching? Do not ignore it. Rather, allow it to grow within your heart and your mind. So say aloud, say aloud, Allah is watching. Allah can see me. Right? Say this aloud. And this feeling and this noise within you, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called it wa'idhullahi fi qalbi kulli mu'min. He called it, it is the water that is in the heart of every believer. Allah has installed a warner within your heart. That warner is the feeling when you say Allah is watching me as you approach to commit a sin. Take advantage of that noise within you.